roll up, roll up for another episode of Film Sense. I'm Frank Woodward, and I'm your host and fellow filmmaker. Today we're discussing production design, and I can't think of a better way to do it than to bring two Academy Award winners in here to discuss what it is the whole field of production design is about. And those are David and Sandy Wasco. I want to thank you guys for coming in. Say hello to our folks. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I have so many questions. I wanted to keep it, start kind of general and get very specific, because you you folks, for people at home who don't know, David and Sandy have worked on everything from Pulp Fiction to the Royal Tannenbaums, Molly's Game, and they just won the Academy Award uh, uh, last uh, two years ago for La La Land. Yes. And uh, so the, these these two have worked in various films of various styles that you've all seen. Uh, so we are definitely going to touch on some of those things, those films in particular. We uh, also want to also look explore what it is to work with a production designer if you're coming on to a film as a first time director or what have you. So I guess the first question is more about like when do you, when do you, David, uh, typically come on to a film? Is it you, uh, you come on in the early script stages or how early would you come on? Well, uh, first, first off, uh, I, I, I want to say that our answers are from, from what our experience is. And uh, it, is, it is a um, kind of an ambiguous uh, job responsibility that uh, can be explained Differently with a different production designer, mm-hmm. but uh, what what we'll com- comment on is our our experience and our uh, our take on it. But um, basically, when when you're making a movie, uh, everything that the camera looks at or that the camera captures has to be um, made or or rented or found as a as a location uh, or built. Um, or uh, done conceptual CGI. Uh, and all of that is kind of under the jurisdiction of a production designer. Uh, used to be called art director, but now um, the title is called production designer. So it's really the, the point person that interfaces directly with the director that takes the director's ideas and uh, turns it into uh, a physical reality that then can be photographed. So, so everything we see on camera has to go through a process of someone like yourself, mixed of working with the director and the DP of everything is on camera for a reason. There's, it's chosen. It's not just. I mean, even when you're on location, you are shaping that location to whatever uh, aesthetic you decided upon. Correct. And and and. My my take on it is to kind of do it in a uh, a quiet way uh, to help the director tell the story. The director, and in our case, we we like to work with a writer director or, or a director that's written a script. So what we do is we help them turn the words or the script, which is a blueprint, turn that into uh, a reality, um, unless. The director really wants something to be outstanding, meaning uh, it'll it'll uh, be very noticeable. I kind of like to be background and let the the actors, let the uh, script and the words be the be the paramount thing. Yeah. Um, but in the case, say with um, Wes Anderson, where he really wanted. A, a visual splashy thing, or um, or I, I'll also use La La Land as a reference, where the director really did want it to become uh, well. He wanted it to bounce back and forth between reality and then um, uh, a surreal uh, L.A. world. Uh, but um, yes, everything has to be everything has to be uh, thought out and and in a way subliminally helps the actors do their job. Because also uh, under the jurisdiction of the art department is the prop department, the things that are going in the, in the actor's hands. Um, it, even things like uh, cars and, and picture vehicles. I, I kind of liken that to almost uh, like a costume. Like you're putting some, somebody in a vehicle. I care deeply about 
uh, picture cars and and what they say about the actor and the character that the actor is playing. Uh, I share a passion for cars with a couple of directors we were lucky to work with, like Michael Mann, who is a who is a a, a, a car nut like me, <laughs> and we uh, uh, anguish over. Uh, things that might seem to be very mundane and just background, but uh, that also falls under the uh, uh, art direction umbrella. Set decorating um, is the other really important department within the department, and in my case, I work uh, exclusively with Sandy Wasco, who is a set decorator, who I think uh, in general, I give a bigger voice to than what a decorator would normally, um, uh, how a decorator would function in, in, a, in a routine Hollywood movie. Mm -hmm. You want to contribute on that? Yeah, you, you yeah. have kind of a different uh, I mean, just, working relationship. In many ways, it's almost like two production designers. That's how I, I look at, at Sandy's role. Which is a lucky thing. I think the because we started in the mid-80s, there wasn't a lot of film weren't film classes per se. So everyone, this goes back to what David started saying, everyone sort of learned by doing at the time. And I think that might have been maybe less the case, I think even the case with some directors at that period. Everyone was aware of film history and that had certainly come into uh, universities and, and high schools as something people would learn. But the actual hands-on um, doing it, a template for how to do things, wasn't around. Well, yeah, the film schools at the time were, even though they were becoming prominent in the early 80s, even in the late 80s, they had not become like they are today with the LA film schools and the, 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 the AFI. Which AFI, is, yeah. And, yeah. Which in a way is great for all of this because we, we, are, we do do things differently than another production designer does, but so do the directors. So everybody, everybody when things are brought together to make the movie, when it's finally the time after all the, the the writers are done and the producers are done and the money's there and it's time to go, people are hired, put together. They're all coming from different backgrounds and different experiences, but somehow when people, the when it works right, everyone is flexible, everyone is, is quick, they know what they're doing, they each have their own responsibilities, they get them done. And so when we're, we're learning, what we do is bring our talents and I'm sure a director should never, um, you know, be ex expect or they just say what they want because we're flexible and we'll listen. Mm -hmm. And also, um, and we know their their vision is different every time, depending on on whether they are the writer or they're a hired gun. But you've had the good fortune of working with directors who are very visually keyed into what they want. Uh, uh, but you also work, work with these directors like uh, Quentin Tarantino and Wes Anderson and specifically at a time where they were also still finding their visual voices as well. Uh, can we talk, maybe talk a little bit about how much uh, of a, a working relationship you have with the, those, those guys, uh, and especially since, I mean, looking from Reservoir Dogs to Pulp Fiction, you see Quentin's style developing very much visually and Wes Anderson clearly from Bottle Rocket which, uh, to Royal Tannenbaums was a uh, definite oh. arc. Uh, mm -hmm. How was, were they very open to those kind of things? Or were they coming to you with ideas? Was it a back and forth? Well, uh, yes, yes and no. First of all, we were very lucky to uh, work with a few uh, wonderful uh, directors that were, and we, that we helped them find their voice, if you want to look at it that way. Um, as was with Wes Anderson, the first three of his movies. Um, some directors can um, verbally articulate what they would like to try to do, and that, of course, is, is a really is a, is a bonus benefit. But even even if that's the case, where like with Damien Chazelle, who was very specific about what he wanted to do, you you still kind of have a template early on and an idea that you try to shape early on in pre-production as to what the movie will look like. But then ultimately when the thing is done, um, it, it might somewhat look the way he was describing, 
uh, with with uh, but we also like to work in an environment where it's not super rigid and if you have an idea um, or if there's a concept that we're we're kind of working within the limitations of uh, we're open-minded that if an actor has an idea if the director gets a last minute idea we can we can change that so uh, so the finished product isn't always something that we kind of map out early early on and we really are um, some of the first of the of the below the line craft people that are hired on you traditionally um, when they're trying to figure out uh, what a movie is going to look like they'll hire uh, uh, a production designer and a location person and then they'll try to figure out well where do we want to film where do we want to shoot this movie what city do we want to shoot this movie and that was the case with when we did um, Wes Anderson's second movie, uh, Rushmore, uh, we ended up going to location expos with Wes. We meaning Sandy and I. I, I like to involve Sandy um, so she's getting firsthand information and can hear directly uh, from what the director is saying as opposed to me relaying something. But that, but again, that's another um, um, thing that is... is uh, 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 my responsibility now is to, to gather the information from the director and then to disseminate that to all the other departments, the costume department, the camera department, to show exactly what the director wants to, to say. But, um, but we're usually the first people hired on and we, the early, the early um, stages of the movie is when uh, it's kind of a quiet time and it's the most relaxed time because you're just brainstorming and you're just trying to get a concept and get something figured out and uh, it's kind of the most fun time early on uh, when you're in a car with the location manager the director and us and we're just talking about things and even casual talk little bits of information come out of that from the director that are words of wisdom that that then you know it's kind of an aha thing and we we can make note of that and then incorporate that into uh how how we're going to carry out the look of the movie but um it's also um kind of the most people heavy department i i think which sometimes can be with when you total up with all of the construction people in the prop department and the decorating department and um, uh, it's hundreds of people and I also like to liken what we do uh, as to what an architecture firm does in that when they're building a skyscraper there's a similar amount of people as to what uh, what it takes to make a movie I believe it's the most uh, people heavy art form of, of our time right now. Uh, Filmmaking so, for sure, but definitely a, an art department on a film set, like you're saying, is massive. Yeah, it's it's a lot of people, right. and and now, which isn't the case with when we had started, there's uh, almost two departments that are working side by side, and uh, and that is the art department and visual effects. That wasn't so much the case when we started, uh, but now that seems to be. Uh, very common in uh, in a lot of movies, even movies that may um, have the illusion that they are um, uh, should have just shot on the spot. Like one of our favorite um, uh, contemporary movies is is Roma, which um, it really looks like you know uh, it's a period movie, so there was great effort going into uh, pulling that off, but. But it looks like it was just shot in Mexico City, and, uh, and but when you really start to think about it, there's so much uh, things that I, 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 and again, I did not work on that movie, but um, but my my uh, observation is that there was a lot of things that were done to uh, heighten and manipulate and uh, and help uh, do some things that that I thought were um, uh, either dangerous for the actors or. Uh, very interesting, like the the scene in uh, where where uh, 
she saves the kids in in uh, in, oh, in the, the ocean, the water, the and I thought that was. And Sandy thought that it could have been CGI with the. So 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 that's a so the visual effects department is again something that currently is is working hand in hand with the art department and often almost in the same room together. Uh, well, they're but, essentially building sets just digitally. Yeah. So they're building sets, they're dressing sets digitally. Yeah. So I imagine you both of you, would, uh, of you have to interface with visual effects in that way yeah. as well. You know, and something else I was thinking about that I personally never really, you, it's in the back of your head, but you don't really think about it, but also too, wardrobe and makeup. I mean, because mm -hmm. you, You'll come on and you'll discuss color schemes. You'll discuss looks and periods and different. So I imagine, as a production designer, you're involved in meetings with almost every department, even ones that don't come under the heading of art department. Well, it's it's it, it is it is. I, I look at my my responsibility as trying to relay. Uh, it's it's a, it's being able to communicate and it's also being able to listen. Two things that I'm I'm still working on, but um, but to, to be able to uh, interpret what the director wants and then talk with um, the costume department or uh, camera department or prop department. Uh, I uh, also work where I, I do not design costumes. Some some of the people that do what I do do the costume design at the same time. So there's a uh, uh, I, I think, um, and I uh, have full full respect for people that can take on the two two kind of Herculean jobs, but um, but being able to relay all that information and how I like to work, in answer to your question, like with a costume designer, is to just let them know um, early on what we're planning uh, for uh, the room color, even what what type of uh, sofa and the pattern of the material are uh, the sofa is made of uh, for instance when we worked with uh, the great Ann Roth uh, costume designer um, on Freedom Land uh, she was so concerned with the type of uh, plaid sofas that we were planning to put into uh, Julianne Moore's apartment and she had us change a few things because uh, it, it would have given her a problem to put her her work uh, sitting down on the on the sofa, so it's it's just it's just working together with uh, with um, the different departments and being able to help again uh, an actor not disappear in a room and and be unnoticed or make them really pronounced in a room uh, with where we're picking the paint color. Do you yourself so put together a lookbook of th things for yes. different departments? Often. Um, We'll and, and th this is sort of the traditional a traditional thing that we do when we are pursuing a project because the cycle with with the job that we do is it will be employed for sometimes um, a good part of a year making a movie and then once the movie is in the can and it goes to editing and post production we then are out uh, hunting and interviewing for the next movie and often what we do is we put together a lookbook which um, is something that can be exactly what the name is is a it's a physical hard copy book of images often a notebook um, uh, uh, that can then be uh, brought around uh, uh, digitally on uh, a um, on an iPad or on a laptop and shown to the different departments of, of this is what the movie should look like. Now, when we um, met Damien, who uh, uh, interviewed me for La La Land, he, he actually had a, uh, a lookbook that he put together. And coincidentally, a lot of the images that I was showing him in our lookbook were the same images that he found. And we... We still like to work, uh, you know, with with obviously on the, on the on the internet you can find almost anything, and, and I'll and I'll and I'll say almost anything because we still have a hard copy library, and we still have wonderful library access here in in the great city of Los Angeles, like the Brand Library in Glendale. That's an art and music library. That are things that are not on the internet. 
and and you can just simply find that stuff and mix it mix it up and mix it in with things that you're finding on the internet and then sometimes you know we do that ourselves meaning me and Sandy but then sometimes um, I'll hire what is called a researcher and it's a um, it's a position that actually is not covered by any union jurisdiction but is is somebody that can uh, help really dig deep in the internet and come up with amazing uh, images about um, the character, about the subject matter of what we're doing. Uh, we had, uh, uh, in a few instances, had amazing people help us. Um, Alex Bowden uh, from uh, Berlin and London worked with us uh, on Inglorious Bastards, and he was a master uh, at research, and I still have saved his uh, 27 notebooks that he put together for uh, World War II uh, that helped us uh, create the proper look for Inglorious Bastards. Well, we had 10 weeks of prep uh, now, for that, that, so he was invaluable. Yeah, oh, wow. that, really invaluable. that director, Quinton, is uh, different to Damien in that he never had a, a lookbook per se, but Quentin would come to the table with a whole list of movies that he would like us to look at and reference for the look of the movie. And we actually uh, were able to uh, pull a few ideas from various movies that he had us look at um, that then ended up becoming built sets and incorporated into, into that movie. You know, two other areas, uh, we've talked about different departments. Um, two departments that everybody in, uh, who watches films even casually know come into play are camera department mm -hmm. and even though they're not really a department but I'm going to call them acting the actors they're like that and um, and then split, so I'm going to go over to Sandy for a second now we, we talked about interacting with, war, interacting with the wardrobe but what you do specifically uh, in decorating a set you're decorating with an eye for that character do you ever have a chance to interface with any of the actors about like Oh, I would have maybe a, I would have something weird like a lava lamp over here or something like that, if they, or, or anything like that. I always I learned early you have to check with the director first sure, yeah. because I've got early on. I remember on a little American Playhouse getting into some trouble with that. But and some directors are really open to it because they've discussed the character with the actor and. The actor has brought things from their past, their grandfather or something else, or their grandmother, or whatever, David to Carradine. the character. Yeah, David Carradine in Kill look at, Bill. Uh, his furniture for he, Kill Bill. He he did have me look at the furniture, but he didn't really have a look. He didn't really have a nest. There was no house that was David Carradine except for the casa, the um, the finale, his mansion in Mexico. And in Kill Bill, yeah. But we did go through his his lockup. I think it was over in Glendale or something. He had those pod lockups and had them lifted down and we went through them. And he had this retractable samurai sword that he, he just hit me in the chest with it and it retracted. But that was one, I think we ouch. used it too. It was like an ouch, yeah. But it was a perfect David Carradine thing. Also early, there were others though in Jackie Brown the main actor there's father Robert Forrester, Robert Forrester was did actually work for Barnum and Bailey and did work with elephants training them and and I'm perhaps in the ring with them but so there was lots of memorabilia from that in his bail bonds office oh, okay. so that it was did, wonderful it didn't directly relate to but it's the character but uh, Quentin had a pretty uh, easygoing rapport between the actors and us and Robert Forrester did approach us and said that he wanted to have he be surrounded by some ephemera from his father who I'll repeat what Sandy said he was a professional uh, circus, uh, Burnham and Bailey circus uh, elephant trainer so he came with a big box of stuff that um, we thought great and we we just spiced it in and used it all around his office which was uh, set up in, in Carson, uh, which again, I'm, I'm proud it's another kind of cool movie about Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because we, um, you know, we've done now, I think like 
13 movies about Los Angeles, which is really kind of a neat thing. But, but getting back to um, we'll interfacing back to with the actors, um, uh, David, I'll go back to David Carradine. He's a car guy also. And there were a few times when he would, he would just sort of wander or appear in the art department and we would be talking. And um, even though he didn't drive a car, there was to be a car that he ended up uh, uh, bringing himself out to this trailer out in Barstow where there's, a, you know, where there's a scene. So the car doesn't drive, he doesn't drive in it, but it is parked right out in front of this uh, L driver's trailer. So um, we, we brainstormed and brainstormed and we ended up going to one of my favorite car designers, uh, uh, Gregato Giugiaro, who did the uh, Di Tommaso Pantera, and then we found an even more obscure Di Tommaso Mangusta. Very few of them made incredible car, um, and that then was uh, found through uh, the Pantera Car Club of California. But we ended up getting one and delivering it out there, and David uh, David was thrilled. So. Here's a, a sample an example of uh, doing things that will help them do their job, help the actors do and their make job. Make them feel immersed in make what Make them feel happy exactly. if this Get is something them. that, as long as the director is is part of the, in the loop of it. So everything, and again, getting back to communication and uh, where everybody's talking and everybody's communicating and the director is on board with this and Quentin was showing pictures of it and he was, yeah, you know, yeah, cool, that's great. But he's, Quentin is not a car guy like Michael Mann. Um, and I'm actually shocked to hear that. Yeah, but but in um, in La La Land, Ryan Gosling was really concerned with this car that then he then drives around in, and it becomes you know, and it and it's seen um, you know from the very beginning of the movie to the to the end of the movie, and and actually when the movie jumps forward to kind of a dreamlike future where he has more money, we get a, a new version of the car. Uh, but um, he, he worked with us and ended up finding this car, which wouldn't have been my first choice, but it's what he liked and he wanted to use for uh, the car that appeared th throughout the movie. But um, I, I, I would think that, I would think exactly as you said, he's like, you obviously have to do things through the director, but I would think that the actors really would like like walking onto a set that's populated with things that it, it make them feel like their characters are as at home. Definitely in Molly's game, uh, the when she took over the game, the place felt dressed the way that she would dress it. Yes, you know because her character she had a, a, a taste for fun, the finer things at that point, so even she was starting to. She dressed herself that way. She was dressing the the, the, the place that way because going from the um, the uh, Cobra room to mm -hmm. the suite mm -hmm. and and everything like that is a is a total jump up in class. Yes, that was that's yes. that's another uh, interesting example of interfacing where the actor uh, or the uh, real character because in a way that movie is almost like doing a documentary because it it is a true story. We did have a book to base it on, and uh, I love it when we are on a project that is based on a book, and and you can actually use the book as a as a reference as long as the director is okay with that as well. Uh, but early on, uh, I had the lucky opportunity to meet with Molly Bloom, the person that wrote the book, uh, and I had a few meetings. This is super early. Uh, when uh, Sandy and I had met with Aaron Sorkin at his house, and he he also um, uh, is very very prepared and very uh, has lived with this story and has kind of knows it backwards forwards upside down. Uh, but he had me meet with Molly, so I had one or two one on one meetings with her face to face. So I was able to ask her a whole bunch of questions uh, about a whole bunch of different things. But then when the production um, was steered to Toronto, which um, was done because of uh, the bottom line, trying to, to be thrifty with, with the modest budget of the movie, um, we lost 
uh, one-on-one connection with her other than through the email. But Sandy then kind of kept the connection with Molly Bloom, who was very, very helpful with, um, she became very, very good friends, or was always very good friends with uh, the Viper Lounge owner uh, that was her original boss. And even though it became kind of a, a, a lawsuit thing and, and she, in the movie and in real life, uh, she, she disconnected with this person, she remains in touch and connected Sandy with this person who was able to take pictures around his office um, as to what his office looked like in reality. So that ge- these are all things that give us, us ideas and you know we're not doing a documentary but we are uh, uh, these are things that are tremendous help and and uh i will say that there was a lot of interaction back and forth between sandy and um and uh molly bloom and then uh i forget the fellow's name that was the viper lounge guy but uh, very 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 helpful but this is again in answer to your question with with interfacing with the actors we're not always supposed to do that it's kind of there's a a, a an unseen line that you just don't cross right, there yes, we're yeah. we're the craft people that are you know that are just helping uh below it, the line uh but sometimes it's encouraged it's it always stri- strikes me as because even on a small show like the the show i'm on um uh, which is a marvel runaway show you walk into these sets which are the the main kids' rooms, and they're decorated with posters and toys and things that you think would be, be mean something to that kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I know th- with our actors, they probably don't. They just walk on the set. And they're probably, oh yeah, apparently I'm into NASA. Mm-hmm. Um, but it seems that's like one other other level that just gives these films that feeling of reality, which is which I mm-hmm. which is. What I think you mean when you say documentary just has that feeling of reality to mm-hmm. it, um, which I yeah. Even, that, for you know, us, Molly's was interesting because it was more realistic than other mm-hmm. films we did, which was really great in a way. Well, well, it was yeah, a nice change for us. Well, yeah, I can see why so I see why it would be. But even in your films, which I I, I this my own definition of it, which I consider more storybook. Yes, uh, like, exactly. Like definitely Wes's films. Uh, in, there's a reality there. You, just, you know what the truth of that world is, mm-hmm. and you guys are always connected to it. You're not just whimsical for whimsical mm-hmm. sake. There's always a logic behind it. Yes, that's right. Um, and um, and that people don't really think about sometimes when they're sitting and watching a film. That as you we said at the beginning of this interview, everything that's on the screen is thought out and discussed and brainstormed over. Uh, if, if especially if you have the time, which is sometimes we don't have the time. Mm. No uh, matter how small. Yeah. I know even Wes Anderson uh, is deeply concerned about the minutia, tiny, tiny things like the color of an eraser on the back of a, of a pencil. Uh, very, very small things that, uh, that then he may choose to do a micro close-up on and it will be a, become a huge thing. Uh, uh, all of that is important. It's all important in, in helping tell a story. And sometimes it's it's a subliminal thing that may appear in just like a second, but it, it's it's sort of seared into the audience's mind. Um, it's it's funny how how uh, quickly you can look at an image. And it will stick with you, even if, I, and again, it's a subliminal thing where how the power of the mind can uh, comprehend something. And uh, so, so all of that plays in with shaping the audience looking at your, your uh, finished movie. Um, Which actually brings me to the, your interactions with the DP, because it's not just what is on the set, but also how it's shot, and how so, you know, what angle of things are shot at, or or how it's framed up. How in, involved are you t- typically, or how have, involved have you been on the the films you've worked on with the DP as far as working on shot design with the director, or, or do you 
kind of yeah. step back and let them just shoot, shoot it? Or Well, I, I, I will say that, again, uh, uh, referring to La La Land, that we had the, the wonderful opportunity to work with uh, Linus Sandgren, the director of photography, and he was just uh, a dream to work with in that um, both he and Damien uh, used their uh, I, iPhone device, iPhone and then iPad to, um, to essentially shoot the movie before any actors or anything were in place. So we, we were really uh, blocking, which means that you're, you're kind of playing out a scene without, before the actors even get there. So Damien would shoot he would ask me and Sandy because we would always be together there. He would say, oh, stand over there where, where Emma will stand. David, stand over there where Ryan's going to stand. And they would come and walk this way, and they would both kind of capture everything. Yeah. So it was really kind of a, uh, all that seems real casual and sort of, you know, tr loose and all. But it, it contributed to then when they ended up shooting the movie, that's what they did. They did the same. The pretty much for the most part, these little things that we we practice with. That was amazing. They and even did amazing. that for the the practice runs for the highway scene, the dancing scene. Right. Because yeah. we set that up in a in a small back parking lot behind our studio that was crushed between like the Glendale Police Station and this little shaggy studio we were working in, and they did it with their iPhones and and really mastered those. Four shots that they were able to do up on the, on the. Uh, yeah, I will say that that did help because when we did do, uh, we called it the freeway dance number. Uh, we had a little window of time because it was just shot over where we were, where we closed down uh, a portion of the Hollywood freeway uh, on a raised interchange. Uh, we had to have everything figured out mm -hmm. beforehand, so the rehearsal. Um, Prior to physically getting uh, on the highway with, uh, I forget it was a hundred cars or something. It was a ridiculous amount of uh, extras dancing and cars, and if that wasn't planned so well, uh, it would have never been able to be pulled off. So, so that's working with the camera person. The uh, I, 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 again, I just kind of try to keep it as simple as possible, where the art department is an open uh, office where the director of photography, often the costume designer, we would plan uh, meetings frequently where we would, we would uh, have kind of a bullpen environment and a big uh, sort of central table where uh, fabric samples, paint samples, uh, all things get thrown on the table and we just talk about stuff. So, and that, and that as you get closer and closer to shooting, and then once you start shooting, you lose all of those uh, opportunities to really, there's, there's no time to uh, interface and relay all that. So a lot of that I try to accomplish in what's called pre-production, which is the time prior to principal photography starting when you then have whatever, 60 days, 50 days, 48 days of shooting, which is uh, usually very regimented and uh, you know, kind of crazy, but prior to that is when you're planning everything. And when if everything, if everybody can sort of be in this sort of uh, open environment where people are talking about things, and I will say that Damien, the director, actually wanted a desk, so we gave him a desk in the art department where he hung out a lot. So we were, we had the luxury of early on, before the actors came on board full time to actually have the director there looking at what we're doing and talking with us about everything. And then I also like to have, um, because I work in a, a very collaborative way, to have everybody listening, but not everybody, but to have the key people in the art department. And I often have to try to um, make sure that Sandy is there and we're hearing firsthand the words that are coming out of the director's mouth and um, uh, how that translates then into um, giving the director what he wants and then having a movie that is really outstanding looking and that's that's the way that I like to work. Some um, art directors or production designers actually like to 
help pick a lens or an angle. And I know that, you know, some of my mentor designers like Henry Bumstead, the great late Henry Bumstead, would like to say, well, this is the best angle looking in this set. Uh, I don't like to do that. I like to, you know, I also like to have a set that's 360, not something that is just one or two walls and you're looking at it in one way. I like to try to have it be a complete world where then you check with the first assistant director and say, you know, is this set okay before we go on to prepare the next set? set. But I like to just kind of deliver it, hand it off, and then let them, if they want to play around, if they want to move a table or, uh, and again, Sandy will often uh, lag behind a little bit and stay on the set uh, while I jump to the next set, getting the next day's uh, set ready. But that's kind of how I like to work. So, so getting back to Frank's question, which is to, to actually be uh, listening to the lenses. Uh, I, I did, uh, I don't so much get involved with that uh, other than I will say with Linus, he did set me up with a program on my iPad that I think it's called Artemis, which uh, is actually a great app that uh, uh, what he does is then you can uh, you can designate the type of camera that's going to be used and then it will then he will designate the type of lenses and then you can actually look through the iPad and see exactly the how wide an angle it's going to be wow. a very 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 interesting and a lot of people don't know about this app but it's really a wonderful well, way like valuable very valuable very interesting uh and i've used it then because uh after uh after uh, la la land we then did molly's game so it was it was kind of a helpful thing but um usually uh, you know uh, other than scouting the location with uh, with camera and then making sure uh, like for instance on the Martin Madonna movie Seven Psychopaths we worked with um, Ben Davis who came in at the 11th hour because he's from the UK and came in at the very last minute and uh, if there's a practical location that then uh, will be difficult for them to light if, if there are windows that are not where they would like windows so that it would help them uh, light the set so we we actually ended up changing a a, a key location uh, um, that that would have been made Ben's job harder to do on seven psychopaths so often a lot of the movies that Sandy and I end up doing are driven by a a more modest budget than than um, than I guess there's no norm but you know, you have micro budget things and then you have kind of mid range budget and then you have very, very big budget elaborate things. I kind of try to find and and appreciate working on the sort of middle and lower range budget movies because when you get so big and vast with crews and it becomes such a big thing that you almost can't even tell who's doing what and how it becomes just such a big thing yeah, yeah. that 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 it's hard to even have a handle on what you know what everybody's doing and what's going on uh, at least that's from my perspective so i try to you know find the 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 gems and also the gems that are really well written that are um modestly budgeted tend to be the ones that where the studios or the overseeing budget uh, providers tend to be a little bit more uh, open to letting the director uh, do what they would like to do. Whereas when movies do get bigger, uh, sometimes the director is just being gets bullied around by uh, by the studio or the money people and um, and that's not what I'm used to. I'm used to, I've been very, both Sandy and I have been very lucky to work with um, uh, writer directors that it is their story, it's their thing, and they and we're helping them do their thing as opposed to doing the studio's thing. Something you touched on a little bit, I'm gonna go back to it a little bit, is, is um, a lot of what we've been talking about is, like you said, has been pre-production. 
how, and this is, I'm going to ask that question separately to each of you mm -hmm. because I know your answer is different. Uh, how does your, what changes for you when you go from production, from pre-production into production? I mean, because I would imagine, Sandy, you, you, that's off to the races more for you. Yes. Same here. The, the oh, same, same for you, okay. The pre-production is, it's, it's short now. But what I ideally and what I work for and work the crews for is to have as much done as possible. Because once you get going, the schedule is starting with the filming crew, opening the set. I do like to stay if there's time, and so far there has been, till every uh, angle is locked so that I know that they've captured what we thought on film. And then they can, then I can leave it to the onset dresser. Um, that gets difficult, of course, when you have to dress something for the next day. So then you pack your bags up, go to the next set, dress that. And that leaves very little time for renting, shopping, buying, hunting. Um, and being able to explain if you've got one or two buyers what you really need. So ideally you want to do all that research beforehand. Um, get the information to the buyers, really see physically, and if not in a photograph, every element you're going to put together mm -hmm. as the film progresses. Also, of course, get all the artwork. If there is, if this is residential or offices versus a fantasy film, you're going to want to look for all the images and get those cleared. Ideally, you want everything, everything that's scripted that may take time to make has to be started right away. Right. So if there's custom furniture or custom, you know, uh, video walls or um, all kinds of any kind of detail like that that has to get done early, you have to do that early. Mm -hmm. And getting back to interfacing with the DP, it, depending on if it's film or digital, you're going to have to start building light fixtures right away mm -hmm. that suit what they need. So right. all that stuff is really first and second week. Anything that'll take six weeks to get finished, you better start right away. <laughs> and I, I will say also, uh, and Sandy hit on a point, more so today because most movies are done uh, digitally, shot digitally with uh, great cameras, but we've also done uh, a few things recently that are shot on film. We actually lobbied uh, me and Charlotta, the DP, for... Um, uh, Molly's Game lobbied heavily to use film for Molly's Game, but we had lost to shooting digitally. But I will say that Sandy's department is, ends up shouldering a lot of the lighting because uh, with the use of digital cameras, the light sensitivity uh, ability on the digital cameras um, allows practical lights, meaning just lights in a living room or to right. light a set. You don't need big movie lights. Uh, so so uh, a lot is put on the shoulder of the decorating department, which has to, has to then end up doing all the lighting. Uh, and even in, um, say, Collateral, which I believe Collateral was the first, uh, I may be wrong, but I believe it was the first digitally shot feature film, we ended up having to, Sandy carried had a, follow truck that had just street lights on it and we had to do as like far as yeah, I can see street lights, street lights. and, uh, yeah. wow, and so often just... that was done uh, ad hoc at the very last minute because Michael uh, and and we would freely be open-minded to him changing his mind and liking a sl getting to a location and then liking a slightly different direction or whatever but being open-minded about that. That's part of what I think well, my I remember job one is, standing. is to be open-minded about changing. Mm. But getting back to prep, it is really the goal is to absolutely have everything completely figured out for all of these 100 plus rooms or spaces or sets or stages that you're going to. And we have a warehouse with shelving uh, that, that then contains all the stuff that goes into these practical locations or stage sets that then get rolled out on a daily basis when you start shooting things. So the goal is get all that stuff figured out beforehand. And then inevitably what's going to happen is uh, you're going to have all that stuff 
I usually like to have a plan B on a couple of things like a plan B sofa or a plan C sofa or things that that if certain things don't quite work, you have a couple of different things, options of things. And a costume department works the same way. You, you have a couple of things that, that you, you know, it, this is perfect. And then when you're going to shoot it and you have the character addressed a certain way and they get an idea and they want to change it. So that, so that, so always things are going to come up at the very last minute and you want, you want backup weird things. But uh, the pre-production is when you really try to figure out everything as best as possible. And it goes back to even just conceptualizing the movie. You kind of have an idea of what it's going to be, but ultimately you really don't know and you really want to be open-minded about, about not minding these changes or, or being asked to do something completely different at the very last minute. Um, um, what's funny, I can't remember uh, the name. We, we went and saw uh, talk a wonderful mentor production designer i believe it was tony walton uh who did the really interesting movie called the boyfriend it was a ken russell movie mm. and he said that his his um, <laughs> is obscure but no, he's not obscure yeah he's, he, maybe he's a little obscure but at the same okay. time though i think both sandy and i were like oh ken russell okay <laughs> it's a no it's a genius it's a genius director genius movie it was yeah. It was botch cut after he did it, and, right. and completely ended up being released, and it bombed. And then they did a, a director's cut later on. It's a genius. It's a, <laughs> actually it was a reference for La La Land because it is a masterpiece musical. He said that he would always carry around with him a huge wide roll of aluminum foil for the director because. He could then shape anything with his aluminum foil. He would take and make a chair out of the aluminum foil. And like if they wanted something, like that was his. That was his. I thought, holy great. shit, this is a great word of wisdom. So I would always carry around a big roll of black wrap. You know, the, yeah. the aluminum foil for light, heavy duty aluminum foil. You could make anything out of it. So, so. well, it's it, look. It's, it's, it just goes to show everybody that no matter what level you're working at, and no matter what visionary you may be working at with it's there's always going to be something that you have to think on your oh, yeah. toes yeah it's um and then, and because you talk about like having the different couches yeah and how many times we all walked on set yeah and just that day you never thought about it but the the, the way that that person looks on that texture yeah. couch it's just like nope not working no you yeah. got it exactly. yeah and the, 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 that happens yeah. more often than we think mm -hmm. And that's a wrap on part one of this two-part episode of Film Sets. If you're enjoying yourself, please be sure to subscribe, like, share, and comment. And now, on to part two with guests David and Sandy Wasco. Film Sense is registered under Creative Commons, produced by me, Frank H. Woodward. And now, part two of our discussion with David and Sandy Wasco. I always liken the first day of principal photography as you're, you're kind of then over the hump. It, it becomes, it, not only does it become kind of crazy or busy and you go from kind of like third gear to overdrive uh, when you start shooting, but... You, there's almost this feeling of relief, whereas you, you work up to the day of principal photography, and it's this great feeling of relief after you do, um, often right up to that date, you do a tech scout, which is when you take the whole crew around in a, in a bus and show them all the locations, and you go to the stages and show them the sets that are being built. It's a tremendous feeling of relief when you start shooting. But then it's also... Uh, it's almost like a sporting event where you have to f you have to be so physically uh, f your stamina has to be at such a high level to be able to then almost not sleep where you're doing things 24 7 where you have to make sure that um, there's a set ready the next day for for shooting uh, and 
you know, on some of these movies, we're going, we're moving the entire production, which is, you know, many, many vehicles and trailers and trucks and whatever each day or each night to the next location. And then we're having to get everything ready. So it, it becomes, uh, it becomes this routine where uh, we will, we meaning Sandy and I will open the set early. Uh, director, you, you quietly walk through with the director and often the uh, assistant director and then you you make sure that everything that is needed is there for the day of shooting you have you have what's called a call sheet which is a list of what's planned for that day and you want to make sure that all the props and all the picture vehicles essentially all that stuff is also the responsibility of the art department you know um, all that is there for, for that day and um, and then the routine has it then that both Sandy and I usually depart from the shooting set and then go to then the next set that is getting ready for the next day and you work with your crews. Now that all those sets are usually also in progress um, prior to the morning <clears throat> of going right up and working on them the day before. They're usually in progress sometimes for weeks getting things figured out or painted or signage or billboards or whatever. Uh, if it's a whole street scene where, you know, if it's a period street where you're putting, you know, tons and tons and dump trucks of dirt out on the street, all that has to be done prior to the day before. But the routine has it, then you get the next set ready for the next day. And then, um, then I often go back to the shooting set, sometimes lunchtime, sometimes the end of the day, and you just check in, make sure everything is okay so I'm, I'm not a production designer that usually likes to stand you know with my hands crossed on the set uh, watching things being filmed I don't I don't uh, once I hand over the set it's to my liking and if they want to change things that's totally cool with me if they want to move things around or or if they want to call and say David we need something that's not here you know you got to get this here for now uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that but I don't usually like to hang out on the set Whereas Sandy will, if it's a key thing, or if we have to show progress in in an, in a character's apartment as time has to progress, or if you have to go backwards in time and things, uh, we don't usually like to leave that up to the onset dresser. Or Sandy will be very um, thorough in taking photographs of the set gets pre-dressed prior to the day of shooting and we'll give the photographs to the onset dresser so that he he or she has a um a, a blueprint for okay that's going back to scene number 32 we have to move everything over to here because it you know the the, the actor didn't uh, uh, the character didn't uh start working at this place yet and they don't blah 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 blah, blah. so right oh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of continuity yeah. that has to be yeah. taken yeah. into consideration uh just to keep that whole but you're, when you're doing, your thing is usually the, the drawings are started for the sets, then the drawings have to be okayed by the director. Often then they'll do a model, and the model, it's great for a director who's not good at looking at plans. They then look at the model, then, then building, then it's, then it's either yayed or nayed or worked on a little more. Then the progress begins on building it, and then this whole scheduling of when the final nail is put in the set and the painters then come in and then the electricians for wiring all my team will come in and put in all the light switches and the vents and the ceiling pieces and then of course the wallpaper and the mm -hmm. rugs and then the furniture so if the paint isn't dry by the, a few hours before shooting yeah. or, or often or the, the decorating department gets <laughs> squeezed between uh, the building department, which is part of the art department, the construction, and the lighting department, which is not part of the art department. And uh, usually the building uh, uh, construction takes more time uh, along with the paint. Uh, like Sandy saying, paint is drying when she is then allowed to come in with her crew and her trucks and her furniture and her stuff. Um, and it usually uh, compresses and becomes a shorter window of time for her to be able to do her stuff. So it's just getting back to the benefit of having the pre-production and re being able to think these things out prior is really is 
is really good. It's really helpful. Yeah. And what, as you said, Sandy, making sure that everybody get it all done now. Yes. Because we will be at a point where we're going to have five other departments on top of us. Right. Right. And we right, don't right. have the time. Yeah. I also uh, am a, a big uh, lover of models to help um, because I can look at a blueprint and completely comprehend and understand how how you know, a room will be and windows and whatever. Uh, and even uh, a white model, which is sort of a term for just a foam, a quick and dirty foam core model, um, where you build something uh, and then that becomes a tool that's brought and put down on a table in, in a room where then you have all of your other departments, even outside of the art department, and everybody's looking at this model. And often, this is usually a very helpful tool if you're doing anything that involves stunts or trickery, particularly in a, in a, in a case where uh, anybody can get hurt. Uh, that it, it helps relay all this information, and everybody then can comprehend. Some people can't even look at a model, and they can't comprehend what, 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 what you're talking about. In the case with um, where there was great danger in the movie *Inglorious Bastards*, because we had to, in a scene, have a raging fire in a cinema um, interior, and uh, there was a potential of, of of stunt people getting hurt. Um, we built a very, very large model of the cinema. Um, what do you call it? Seating area. I can't even think of the name, the name of it. The theater. The, 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 the seating. The, the seating area. area. Yeah, it's, it's and we built a huge, and that was actually supposed to be a practical location at first, which we found in in Berlin. Uh, but then, because of the amount of fire that we had to do, it 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 had to become a set. And then we had to find a place to build a set to do a fire, and we ended up going into a concrete factory huge factory that had I believe the ceilings were all close to a hundred feet high so we were able to build this massive set and then we built a 50% size set of the cinema screen with um, that it showed that was able to show the projection on the screen so the models became a really good tool was able to convey all this information to all these different departments and then also the visual effects can do a previs where you can do uh, kind of a walk through a room even before a set is built or even if it's a practical location if everything is measured out you can really get an idea of how the how a camera and and uh, a blocking or, or or meaning a camera move can be done one of the first um, examples where that was put to use for my experience was on the movie Collateral, which again was the first digitally shot movie. Um, we had a really great set designer who's now a great art director, Clint uh, Wallace, who did uh, a previs of a big nightclub that we built that where we had a big shootout in a nightclub where we had, again, it was a potential to be dangerous because you have hundreds and hundreds of extras and then you have um, uh, a shootout within all these extras. And, and even though it's blanks and whatever, everybody's supposed to be acting like crazy and, you know, somebody's going to get their arm broken or whatever. So it, the previs thing was was able to help convey that all to everybody and we were able to figure that out. But we also built a model of the nightclub set and it helped everybody talk about these things. We've touched on a lot of different uh, disciplines that goes into what you do from day to day. So I'm going to step out of the production process and talk a little bit more about being a production designer. So this, I guess, is a more specific question for both of you. Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned you're, you're into you, the cars. What other fields of study do you bring to, but also you're a, a big student of architecture. Uh, do you have a lot of different, uh, what, what, what informs your design? Well, um, I, I again liken what we do for movies as to what an architect does for building a uh, building or a house. That's sort of what what we do. We you, you have to do a blueprint that then goes to builders to do a building. 
Um, and I, again, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but I like in what we do or what movie makers do and we're part of the movie making team. I, I would liken it to building a skyscraper in downtown. In downtown Los Angeles, I believe that the cost of the tallest building of the land, uh, on the landscape downtown, it was called the Book Depository Building or the Library Building. I don't know what it's called now, but it was I Am Pay. The cost on that building, completely to build the tallest building in downtown LA was less than building than creating than the budget on some movies mm. that are being made. So that just gives you a, a comparison. Sure. And and it's true. Yeah. The cost on that building, the tallest building, which is a white circular. Uh, yeah, right by the right by the right across from the library, right yeah. there on, the, on that. On the, um, it's not Bunker uh, Hill. Is yeah. Bunker so Hill? so that's sort of what now. Um, I am not an architect, I'm not a registered architect, but I, ha I have an informal education that, uh, and, and upbringing that, uh, and, and a love for architecture that, um, that uh, uh, allows me to sort of u research that way and use that tool um, or that process with, um, helping figure out what you're going to do for sets, meaning it still starts out with basic rudimentary being able to sketch. Some people do everything digitally, but there's still the use of, of both digital tools as well as just low-tech sketching uh, on, on even, even an absolute uh, basic thumbnail napkin sketch doodle can come up with an idea with an idea. Um, as to how to do how to do something, Sandy is actually better than I am with doing pretty good uh, sketching, mm. and um, and uh, you know I'll give credit where credit's due. But some of the some of the doodling ideas that then a director can do, for instance, Damien would do like stick figure drawings, um, and and stick figure ideas and graphs and things, and that then. Get, we can translate, but then I'll hire a concept illustrator uh, who is also used. As a matter of fact, even when I did Kill Bill, I used an architect, uh, an, an old timer guy, uh, architect illustrator, that did work for um, a very big LA architecture firm, and he did some concepts for. Uh, Bill's Hacienda set, which uh, started out as to be a uh, house in Mexico for the Bill character, the David Carradine character, and then it, it morphed into becoming a hotel room. But I used a concept illustrator who actually worked, it was like an oil painting, and he did an oil painting. Often now they're done digitally, but they're painted digitally, and I had a fantastic couple, I, I, a couple people that were. Uh, Work and one in particular uh, on *Inglorious Bastards* that did images that were just like paintings. Now I will say that some directors don't like that, and actually, in the case with um, *Inglorious Bastards*, I ran into a bit of a problem where, having worked with Quentin on on many other films, virtually every film up to there that he directed. I think it was seven movies. Um, he, Quentin, didn't usually like to use storyboards, and because he felt that they actually locked him into a direction where he uh, was limited with being able to brainstorm and get ideas. Yeah. So when we were then, um, as each movie progressed from Reservoir Dogs to Pulp Fiction, and we, we built some big sets for Pulp Fiction, but usually it got bigger, 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 and then we're on Inglourious Bastards. These were big sets that we were building, huge sets. Yeah. We had to do some concept illustrations and things that conveyed to everybody. He, he actually got miffed that we were doing concept illustrations and, and asked me to stop doing that. But it was after the fact, and we were able to convey the information to everybody and the builders and whatever, uh, but it's a way that the studio and the producers see what you're doing, and 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 everybody's like, oh yeah, that's what it will look like. Okay, great, go go for it. Here's here's a million dollars for that set. Well, and so, as you mentioned before, communication is very key to everything we do, because mm -hmm. especially with the amount of people that you're 
I mean, we have it's such a game of telephone on a film set from the time the director tells you what they want to the time it actually gets to the set oh, yeah. that you're lucky it even bears any resemblance to anything at all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but so that's why all those things come in extremely. I love it as a location manager on a tech scout when art department comes to me with a big thick pa- uh, packet. So I go, oh, here, here's oh, yeah. this. Here's how this layout's going to be. That's what this is going to. Oh, that's where that statue is going to go. Fantastic. Yeah. Because it all helps. It yeah, all helps. it's a communication yeah. thing. It's a, yeah. and 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 it doesn't even matter if you're not in the art department. If you're if you are a good listener, which I'm still learning to be, uh, <laughs> and and then a good a good explainer, you know, you can kind of explain or interpret what. But that's sort of if you can interpret and then explain to the other departments. That's all part of what. Um, how this business is done but then I'm thinking that that's how architecture is done that's how a lot of businesses are done and a lot of people can't listen or they don't they they listen and hear different things it's it's funny how um, I usually well not usually I like to have uh, again a bullpen environment and the and the little window of time when you have a director that can come into the art department I get everybody together, all the key people, and we talk about what we're going to do. And we all listen to what the director wants to do. And it's funny because then the director is done talking and they leave. And then we say, okay, what did he say? And it's funny how so many people hear different things. Even though it's that person three feet in front of you saying, this is what I would like to do. And we're all like, well, I don't, I don't think he meant that, you know. And it's like, so it's like, he meant this, you know. So it's like, uh, no, but but that's but it it is so that's all part of it, and that's the fun of it. It's 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 nerve wracking. It's um, well, it's definitely an art form like no other because of that. Yeah. I mean, even you, 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 although you liken yeah. it to building a building, and, and, yeah. and that itself is a craft, and, and, yeah. uh, obviously. Yeah. But. Uh, yeah, I, I tell screenwriters who, or I, they'll get their script and like, here's here's my script, and they think it's literature. Yeah, and like you, you do realize this script is going to pass through a minimum of like eight to ten key decision makers before it's then handed off to equally as many craftsmen before it's said, you know, you're lucky okay. if it bears any resemblance to what you wrote. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, but that be, said. Yeah. Aaron it does. Sorkin, though Aaron Sorkin or Dave Mamet, yeah. or Quentin, those words do not change. Those well, the, are the dialogue their, may not yeah, change, yeah, but I'm okay. sure. I'm, okay, I'm sure. Okay. I'm sure. Not to, not, to, not to challenge you on your yeah, own interview, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. but uh, yeah. but to uh, but the, I would I would venture to say that they, well, Mamet, I know will stick to the word. Oh yeah, uh, and uh, but what their concept of what the set lay looked like or how the That's scene was going to play out. Yeah. I, I'm sure that they're if they come from a theater background like mm-hmm. that he he does he knows that things are going to be discovered yeah. in the process yeah and they, I'm sure they keep themselves open to that but I yeah I wouldn't uh, want to yes. be the guy arguing the change word of uh, any one of those no writers. I remember I'm <laughs> trying to think of who Sandy was talking with who did you want to have was, changed I don't remember but it was I, either but out of context been, I think it was Dave Mammoth it, I, don't I know, think it was Dave Mammoth maybe it was yeah. a word Saying, or something tell, telling him how something. to change, <laughs> change no I don't know what it was I'm sure it had something words. to do with moving through the space I just, yeah. but, but but the other thing that was interesting is getting back to the 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 the, the script and <laughs> and designing the movie is um, in Molly's game there were these long Runs of voiceover mm. that um, that were throughout the movie, and some of the sets, like we 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 actually we ended up virtually building uh, pretty much most of the uh, entire movie was built, even though it was con- contemporary or relatively recent contemporary L.A. and New York, but we built everything and the Viper Room or the Cobra Lounge, how we had to call it in because we couldn't use the name, um, had a hallway where, yeah. where Molly had to get out of her car, and we actually ended up using the Roxy here in L.A. just for the exterior, and then all the interior was built in Toronto. But we had a long hallway where she had to carry uh, a cheese plate and some bottles of wine or something, and then you end up, 
um, introducing this little room, which was the Viper Room, which is a real place in L.A., which is where Johnny Depp, uh, not Johnny Depp, uh, uh, the actor died. Oh, oh uh, Rupert yeah. Phoenix. Rupert Phoenix. Phoenix. Johnny Depp but, was a co-owner. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. He's a co-owner. But, but the, the set was dictated by, we had the dialogue, so it's this long voiceover that Jessica Chastain is supposed to be talking as she goes down this hallway and then you get into the room and you're in the Viper room where, where they, the, the below the club's um, um, a VIP place. So our, our hallway length was dictated by us with script in hand, reading as fast as we could and walking a normal pace and that, that determined then the 40 foot long hallway, which it really isn't in reality. Mm. You kind of, if you go to the club, it's kind of a short hallway and you get in. But you had to build a 40 We had to hallway. build a long hallway that allowed, allowed for the actress to not be moving her voice, but there's voiceover as the actress is walking and then goes in. So you had to give them a hallway long enough to get out of the car, walk down the hallway. So, so, all that stuff, it's all. Oh, all that part stuff of is, yeah, that's, that's figuring it out. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Now, David, you and I, in, in talking, um, you once have, uh, mentioned that you, you sometimes prefer to film on location as opposed to sets. Uh, and in, in recent, with if you look at your body of work, one of the places you've definitely been able to take advantage of, lo- of locations is here in LA. Because uh, you've done a lot of LA centered pieces. Um, well, first, what are those that you prefer about filming on location as opposed to a set? Well, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to downplay doing interesting sets and building sets. No, I mean, there's some of my favorite movies uh, never went to where they were supposed to be depicting. Like Casablanca is all done in a studio, and right. you feel okay, you really went there, and you didn't go there, you know, in in reality. Um, but just for me, as a production designer, I still like to try to um, figure everything out with a practical location first and then manipulating that practical location um, to make it work for a, a set for a scene. And then if all that fails or if you have to do something for uh, safety reasons like the fire in Inglourious Bastards, then you build something. So, sure. but And often that's dictated by most of the things that we have worked on, uh, you know, I'll, I'll have to say I have not done the three hundred million dollar movie. I, I, it's not my, it's not my thing, and I, I prefer to um, work on a movie where the strength is in the script and the writing, and not uh, so much uh, the the spectacle of big uh, visual effects and and big. Uh, you know explosions and whatever that's that's not my thing so often because we are given awarded a project to do that is that is usually uh, thrifty or modestly budgeted uh, the practical location route uh, 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 allows me to get sort of the basis for a set where it's not coming out of my budget, it's coming out of the location budget. <laughs> and then you can then do things to that location. So, uh, and that, that was the case, you know, e- e- even in Molly's game where, okay, it was a movie about LA. Actually, the movie is about LA and New York because she starts in LA and then goes to New York. And in many ways, that movie should have either based out of LA or based out of New York. And, uh, when all was said and done because of the budget limitations and the whatever deal they got with the studio in Toronto, we ended up doing the whole movie in Toronto and building everything. So back up to getting an opportunity to work on a movie in LA. We love LA. LA is a fantastic city. It has changed over the decades that we've had an opportunity to live here. I go back a bunch of years, and each decade it becomes a different city. Uh, I'm I'm uh, a architectural preservationist. Uh, I, I I love to read books about LA. 
L.A., The Architecture of Four Ecologies by Rainer Banham is one of my favorite books. Uh, um, and I pride myself in knowing a lot about L.A. And even though L.A. has been shot so much, it, um, it still has hidden pockets and places that people haven't taken advantage of. And each time I get an opportunity to work on a movie in L.A., I try to find those places and try to show that, you know, pe people usually or producers will say, oh, well, that's shot to death or, you know, we, we, you know, it's been done before. And I try to find angles or things about the city that haven't been shown. Uh, that said, I will still not mind using a location that has been in another movie or doing an homage to the previous movie that that's been in, I'm totally cool with that. I'm fine with that because I think maybe we'll know that maybe that was used in another movie, but the audience may not. So I did approach La La Land as almost the, the, uh, the, the crescendo of being able to do movies about LA. And, and with me starting, uh, one of my very first movies, and I wasn't even the production designer, but it was like a two-person art department, was El Norte, which was, uh, it, it actually won um, uh, the Palme d'Or in 1984, but it, it did end up uh, ending up being filmed in Los Angeles, so I was able to capture the city with practical locations at that time. So that's kind of the beginning and then going to Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction, kind of a, a Quentin take on the city. Um, and actually a bunch of other opportunities. Um, Paul Schrader's Touch, which was an Elmore Leonard movie, uh, Elmore Leonard book, uh, Jackie Brown, uh, mm -hmm. Collateral, which yeah. a lot of people think is a, a great L.A. movie, uh, Rampart, which was um, um, James Elroy, uh, you know, about the police debacle in Los Angeles, Seven Cycle Pass. Then we get La La Land. And it was just a great an opportunity to use the city um, as a backdrop where the director wanted reality and then, and then mixed with then heightened reality and, and magical realism. Well, one of the key scenes of that, for me from that film that does that is the dance up in the Hollywood Hills at, at Magic Hour. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of people have, have thought that that was a set and it, it wasn't a set. It was it was finding um, the view the the view out onto a direction because we did use a lot for for reference and research and for the lookbook we did use refer to a lot of of uh, uh, famous paintings about the city and there uh, was an Ed Ruscha painting uh, I believe and there's actually another couple of painters that have done kind of a fan of the city lights going in the background. Well, the director wanted that and um, along with uh, some great location scouting ended up finding a promontory point in Griffith Park that actually looked north into Glendale um, Burbank and uh, so we rehearsed, rehearsed, rehearsed. We had to bring all the street lights, again, like we did in Collateral. We brought all the street lights, which Sandy's department moved around uh, uh, all over the place and ended up putting them on the pier at uh, Hermosa Beach. Hermosa. Hermosa yeah, Beach. It. So, but it, we find this great location and uh, we were able to rehearse at that location. It was a complicated camera crane move but uh, and then there was kind of a big overhead uh, huge light that dropped a wash of light onto the actors but the good deal of the background was the sun setting so the entire scene and it was a long dance number had to be shot uh, in real time while the sun was setting which you have no control over so um, uh, I think it was shot over two days yes. I believe, two nights or two sunsets, but um, that was that was complicated. Well, and, and it seems yeah. what's what's beautiful about that scene. I mean, yes, you, some people think it would have been a set just because mm -hmm. of the skyscape, mm -hmm. but it's very much like that uh, the scene in 
Singing in the Rain, when they go on to the soundstage, he turns on the exactly. sunset, and then the colors there, it blended old Hollywood musicals and that magical realism that you said mm -hmm. in a practical location, which were very much familiar. If L.A. films you shoot up in the hills, you know mm -hmm. what the L.A. hills look like. Uh, and this, the, the amount of planning that went into that for, mm -hmm. it was amazing to me. It was, it was uh, but, but, uh, uh, but the city does become, and I know this sounds cliche, but it becomes a character in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were able to go to a few places that are our favorite places outside of making movies like the, the um, Griffith Planetarium. Uh, 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 and then we were able to show the, the, the world of jazz, which, which I love as well. We had an opportunity to, to do a few jazz clubs, which again uh, were a combination of practical location and building within the locations. But we uh, we did a no stone unturned for many uh, and cared deeply about every single place that we shot in the movie, like opening the movie at Mia's apartment, which was the um, which was supposed to be in the Hollywood Hills ended up being several different locations. The exterior was down in Long Beach. It was uh, a historic garden court apartment, kind of like uh, uh, one of my other favorite LA movies, Day of the Locust. Um, um, so, you know, we, we then needed for the Mia apartment uh, a bigger interior than what the exterior provided. So then we ended up using a, a large apartment uh, off of Wilshire Boulevard that was actually Ronald Reagan's first. When Ronald Reagan moved to um, Los Angeles, he rented this big apartment. And it was also Clark, Gable. Clark Gable's apartment. So there's, there's a history, a vibe of a history in that apartment that um, but we, we had this big apartment that then we were able to build flats and walls within it to make to, to, to give me his bedroom and different things that was required for the blocking. But, um, but I you know it, it's again y using using the city and, and trying to find things that um, are, uh, are there, sometimes right under your nose. But we actually, in looking around, for these places, try to sh remain within, um, uh, what do you call the circle again? You call it the zone. The yeah, there's, the uh, when you're making a movie, zone, yeah. there's a, a zone of where you're to look for the locations and you're not supposed to exceed beyond that. Well, we went beyond that. Um, the other interesting thing that w one would have thought would have not been a hard location to find in La La Land was because we did a few sort of uh, party scenes in different houses. We called this a producer party where it was kind of a wild party. Uh, well, we had a location found and look, like I said before, it was the director signed off on it, the cameraman signed off on it. And we lost the location because um, in the time from when we found it to when we were shooting, uh, it was used for another uh, video or something and there was noise in the community and the community decided so this became a difficult location to find where you have uh, a, a house in the hollywood hills a fan of lights going off in the background um, uh, we needed to have fireworks uh, in the background it had to have a pool uh, we, we would find pretty much everything but most of the pools now in los angeles are infinity pools and we needed a pool that you were able to have dancers surround it and so so it's funny how what you what you would think would not be hard to find like a producer house in the hollywood hills in hollywood and it became a hard thing to find uh, yeah, well some people uh i mean from as from a locationist point of view uh the simplest location on paper is the hardest to find yeah house yeah. somebody says go find a house yeah that's i hate, dread hearing yeah. that because <laughs> Everybody's like, well, there's what a house What does that there. mean? Like, yeah. There's a house down at the end of my street that you can film at. It's like, really? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> right. um, but it also, LA's been changing so much, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which, which is good because it gives us new looks, but it also is eroding some well, of the Well, I, I think yeah. also that what, because again, 
I am a historical preservationist. Uh, I think that by capturing on film um, uh, some wonderful parts of the city, uh, it's captured forever as long as the film is preserved. Right. But uh, like like one of one of the um, one of our favorite movies is Double Indemnity, which is a Billy Wilder movie. And they actually walk around. They go into supermarkets, and, and it, these are not sets. These I are practical locations. Set, but very interesting. Right. Now, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong. I th- uh, uh, even the house in Sunset Boulevard is gone. The exterior yeah, house of Sunset gone. Boulevard, I believe, is gone. It's gone. So, yeah. so in in a way, yeah. we're saving the city. I I'm not a big fan of the high density housing and the demolition of a lot of uh, uh, of the city to be able to create space to do the high density housing but that's a whole political discussion but but in many ways um, by capturing on film you're you're sort of saving it and it's really interesting the in Pulp Fiction there was an apartment that we called the dope bust apartment where uh, where Sam Jackson and John Travolta walk down, they take an elevator up, and there's a scene in a shootout in an apartment. That building fell down in the earth in the 90, 97 earthquake or whatever, a big earthquake. So that's gone. Oh wow! It's it's it it's interesting how um, the face of the city uh, is changed, and and how some of us have to fight to sort of to keep. To keep certain things, and yeah, that's that Pulp Fiction in particular almost couldn't be made now as a location picture because we we it because it was Pulp Fiction it was chapters we could go back and forth in time a little bit from the fifties to the thirties and forties but because it was Pulp Fiction and sort of a noir story we looked for L.A. noir locations often so there were the thirties apartments buildings there were the fifties diners. But there was oh, an alley, you but know, there an was alley the, the boxers um, yeah. under yeah. The bo- room in the at the arena. Yeah, I think that we used it. We were the we were the last yeah. the last yeah. film company to shoot in. If I'm calling it the right name, the Olympic Arena. The Olympic yeah. Arena that's yeah. our the church. The boxing arena. Yes, I think. It was. And we shot oh, really? hallways Huge in there. Church. And we shot that, and then it's now changed forever and modernized and updated. Uh, and then, of course, we built the little Bruce Willis, um, uh, if you call it like a boxer's uh, hangout room or whatever, where he's... he's and his locker and his locker massage. Room. And that was built. But the, we used the hallways in the Olympic arena. Which were great hallways. Yeah, mm. and very, very interesting. Um, but just yeah. the variety, the craftsman houses, the, yeah. you know, everything. But not only do we use things that were real, all those things had a vocabulary of LA through other films like you did see them in mm-hmm. you know certain architectural things in something like Sunset Boulevard mm-hmm. where you saw them in uh, the 50s road movies or well just like the loss of the 6th Street Bridge mm-hmm. and how, I mean yes that architecture style is still on the 4th Street Bridge and on 2nd Street but that whole design of bridge is so WP yes. it's WPA yes. era, right? yep. WPA era El Angelino yeah and that's now gone. Yes, and that's a huge one. And, and that said, LA in, in a million two seconds. Movies. Yeah. Now yeah. that's yeah. a part. It's a part of yeah. the evolution of 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 all of our culture. I mean, this is what is happening in New York City, and I mean, people now complain about Times Square. You know, when we lived in New York, it was the late seventies. It was very seedy and dangerous, and. Uh, and now it's safe, but people say, oh, I wish it was like the way it was in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> well, you so have to like, go back and forth. Yeah, yeah. One, like, one of the other challenges, I mean, was, well, that's like too far askew, but some of the in, uh, advancements in downtown LA are making it so that you can't shoot it as the every city anymore. No. Because mm-hmm. you've got the bike racks and you've got the bike paths. That's right. At Broadway, broad, stepping out and doing the outside seating. It's... It's, it's amazing. It's cool for LA, but it's yeah. horrible for filmmaking. Yeah. Well, yes. when we when yes. we were given the opportunity to sh- use the Griffith Planetarium in La La Land, uh, which just went under a uh, 
multi-million dollar restoration it was closed for five years uh, it is all original and really fantastic uh, the entrance foyer and the uh, exhibits the Tesla coil all really cool you go into the planetarium modern it's like um, it's like a uh, interior of a theater of a multiplex theater now they totally gutted out the beautiful art deco look that was there in rebel without a cause and um, so uh, we did get with a, a great length of trouble the use of the f the exterior and leading up to the entrance to the um, uh, up to the planetarium but uh, we did replicate, uh, in a way we replicated, but we heightened the deco part of it. Uh, 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 so we gave the director what he wanted because he wanted a very big deco thing in the movie, throughout the movie, woven, th woven throughout the movie. So we were able to build that, but he also couldn't even shoot it in the modern part of uh, the planetarium because we had to do wire work uh, in that scene right, where fine. the actors get lifted into space um, and I will say that that movie was very um, analog low tech very little uh, CGI done in uh, La La Land per the director uh, right through to even uh, doing Mac glass paintings which we were lucky to do um, uh, an old school special effect uh, so we were able to do that and use that in the movie, and that was the director's request. Wow, so you actually had the artist come in and paint on glass Rock, like they Rocco used to? Rocco Gioffri, who we found, there's, there's kind of a short list of these There's guys the that are alive, and he actually worked on the original Mary Poppins, and he did, he did a few paintings, including, uh, there, I mean, you see them for... Like getting going back to what I was saying, if the audience can see something that is one frame, it's seared into your mind. And there's one little frame when you're going to go into the club hachette, which is the the uh, in the kind of heightened end of the movie when you're going to a Paris jazz club. And um, uh, we actually uh, lifted off of a great 1961 Martin Ritt movie called Paris Blues that was Sidney Poitier and Paul Newman. Um, but Rocco painted, and he was like, oh, man, you want me to paint a 20-foot? <laughs> it was a 20-foot <laughs> long, and it took him, like, it took him a long time. This long painting, and then the club was a little, like, one-foot square model and with little miniature neon on it, that club Hachette. So the camera whip pans past the Paris skyline and zeroes in on the club, and then you cut and you're in in this red big hopping jazz club you know but he did that and right. then he did a few other things including an ending of the movie that was uh, canned and we didn't use because um, the director did want to end the movie as an uh, as an homage to um, uh, a old um, Jacques Demy movie, the French director, and I believe it was um, either The Umbrellas of uh, Schoberg or The Young Girls of Rochefort. And it's a scene uh, in this where a car drives away down a street. Well, we actually picked a street way down in Long Beach and he did this massive glass painting with a matched uh, uh, gas station and, uh, uh, and we shot the scene and they opted to do the scene as the audience sees it now, where it's very personal in a jazz club, and it's just, you know, eyes gazing back and forth, and that's it. End of the movie. Well, it did end with them driving together off in in the same car. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and wow. and I didn't know. I mean, you give them all these different things, and then they decide they, they, this is the way they want to end the movie. Right. And it's the director's call. <laughs> so, and so, so much, yeah. so much of the work, though remains unseen yeah uh, which is I'm glad I'm glad to hear you hold on to your notebooks yeah that's gonna be something to see some, yeah. someday soon yeah outside of LA it's changed architecture mm -hmm. what have, have you found has changed the most about the, the what you do in recent years I mean especially I mean, filmmaking has changed we've, we've talked about this yeah. privately 
filming things changed. Yeah. Um, uh, well, without without um, sounding negative, yeah, uh, it the budgets ha- still remain. You know, you have a micro budget, you have a middle range budget, and then you have a massive budget. Even though that's the same, um, the they still haggle with the amount of money that they usually allocate to do uh, for us to do our job, and also haggle and diminish the amount of prep time and the time, and then uh, well, just basically the amount of time that we have to do our job, and then also I don't I don't so much think that the crew size is is hammered down, but maybe that's even reduced. I think that that's the case. That's the Well, sometimes thing. it's harder to get people to be, I mean, if you, depending on what budget you're working at, yeah, uh, it's harder to get good people Yeah, uh, or harder to hold on to them. Like if you're working on in yes. new media, yeah, uh, which is which a lot of these Netflix shows qualify as. Yeah. It, so, and it depends also, uh, you know, now not so much is made in LA, although there is a lot of TV. So there's, there's the movies are coming back to oh, definitely. to Hollywood, which is where they should be, but but there's still the the kind of target cities where it's cheaper to make a movie, and that's the bottom line, and that's where you end up either being brought to Toronto, Vancouver, uh, Atlanta, New Orleans, and then it does become difficult or a challenge for us to then find crew because they'll allow me to bring Sandy, maybe one other person, but usually it's me and Sandy and then um, uh, then we uh, have to find everybody there and because they're so busy, you there's a, usually an A team of people that you can get and then uh, they're busy and so it's it becomes difficult. So that that's that. And then the other thing about what's become different is the prominence of visual effects working kind of in concert together, hand in hand with the art department. That wasn't so much the case. Um, now it's much, now it's... Yeah, working hand in hand is one thing, that's great, but it's it's off. Sometimes we get the pre, we run into previs having already had many meetings with the director before we're even on. Yeah. And so talking about Quentin not liking to see storyboards and locking in, all of a sudden you're locked into something yeah. the director has yeah. has yeah. really for, reviewed for, and for seen. For us to still find, and they're, they're few and far between, is the, is the powerful director that you're making their movie. So it's, it's hard to find a Quentin today. You know, I mean, there's so many directors that are that are basically a hired gun and expendable right. and, and, and which is how I think they like them it, they, that's, have more, they have more control yeah the I studio mean, has more control versus yeah. because they, you see a lot of these guys we don't know if they'll ever become Quentins because yeah. they did a really successful independent film yeah. and immediately were thrown on a Marvel movie or yeah. something yeah well they that's that's yes. my uh, I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember her name but the woman that directed one of my favorite movies from last year was the Ri- the rider uh, she is awarded um, right, yes. the marvel she, she's yeah, uh, she, yeah she just got a, oh I'm, I'm blanking on it too it's it's the um, it's she, the marvel it's a big movie it's a big marvel film that she just got and i can't remember what the title is, but, I'll but it's it's the, the sort of somewhat sequel spin off to <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta think of this one. I, you're right. She got she got a huge Marvel uh, deal. Yeah. To direct something and uh, um, what, about, what was it? Marvel or was it Star Trek? No, it's Marvel okay. because mm-hmm. it's the it's the character. It's that one. It's the one woman. Not Captain Marvel. Superhero. Uh, it wasn't with, Captain because that's been done. No. Uh, well, uh, Black Widow. Black Widow. I believe that's what it is. Okay. Yeah. Let, let's take that again. Yeah, <laughs> the, the director of the writer. Right. Yeah. Yes. But no, it, 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 it's uh, that's a challenge, yeah. and uh, for directors are being allowed to grow yeah. as they would grow. Yeah. Um, you know, and I mean, Quentin's a specific case, but from Reservoir Dogs to Pulp Fiction, narratively is a huge leap. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. From a production point of view, it's still kind of within that. I was realm. still small. Yeah, I was yeah. still small. Yeah, 
I, I don't even remember what Pulp, Pulp Fiction was not a and lot Wes's of And Wes's get bigger and bigger, but they're also relatively manageable. Wes? Anderson's yeah. things. They're they wonderful. They were still, yeah, all, all of those, the three that we still did has control. Were, were bigger, 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 but they were still, like mm. the Tanny's saying, not, mm. not a massive, not what he's doing now, which we have not done. They're Stop much bigger budget. Oh, I mean, like the Isle of Dogs of... And Those are bigger, yeah. Sure, well, yeah, bigger they money take and, so much time. Yeah. Uh, yeah artistically, for you both, yeah. is there a genre or a, or, or some something that's on your wish list? Of, oh, I wish I could do a biblical epic or something like that. Is there some art form or something that you haven't had a chance that you've been wanting to? I, I think that it, it the the easiest way to answer that would be uh, I I wish that we we would always be able to get. Uh, an amazing script and it doesn't matter like I haven't done a, a outer space movie I, there's a few genres that I would like to do a western although I do think that the little uh, an unseen Howard Frank Mosher where the rivers flow north is a western it's a New England western well, it's a brilliant movie um, there are a few genres that we haven't done but to get uh, uh, a really, really good story. It doesn't matter what the genre or I. We haven't really done a musical prior to La La Land, and I wouldn't have said, "Oh boy, I really wish that I did a musical." But when we got the script and when we knew ab about Damien after seeing Whiplash, and and we kind of got connected with him early on before Whiplash even came out. That's what we that's what we want. We want to get continue to get interesting stories where we get invited to be um, to help uh, pull it off. Um, and whatever it that may be, it may, uh, strangely enough, the the faux documentary or the mockumentary of doing um, like a Molly's Game and then even um, something that we actually had started and then there was a hiccup and it sort of um, got put on hold was a, a based on a book called True American which is another true story. Um, those are really to me what at this point in my career I would like to do. I don't necessarily need to get any big splashy art direction thing now if it calls for something that's going to get a recognized um, award for art direction that'd be great but uh, I don't I mean I would say maybe a western would be but but I'm still I don't want to just say a western because then it can be a western that will be a crappy script and I, I'd rather really <laughs> have also like something that's a great story right. and it doesn't matter where what um what as long as it's a great story in the hands of and I usually like that story to be written by the person that then is going to be directing the movie and it's not always the case we are so so fortunate to have had writer directors or people that for the pretty much the most part of what we've done our, our entire career has almost always been an interesting Script that is written about then the person that was that was then uh, going to direct the movie, and I mean we're talking, you know, we're just extremely lucky. I mean to have to have been able to work with um, Aaron Sorkin. Come on, Damien Chazelle, uh, Paul Schrader, Dave Mamet, you know Quentin, okay. Wes. Those are these are really great great writers. Martin Madonna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are, I mean, I, I mean, I, I think you can go to uh, any other art director or production designer, and I don't think they're going to have a list of writer directors that, I mean, we're just extremely lucky. We didn't in, go out that way to, or intend to, but that's how our careers have, e ha career has evolved. It's become really, really, really great, and we didn't know some of these people were going to be that. We didn't know Quentin was going to be. We got the script for Reservoir Dogs, and Sandy was the one that says, "We got to, we got to get this movie." And I, I went after that. Yeah, I went after that. So um, yeah, uh, well, that's, that's that, that, Gregory Nava. Gregory Nava too. I still think that of all the things, 
Oh, had okay. the opportunity to it's watch El Norte American. recently. Yeah, yeah. It was just unbelievably timeless. It was fucking People 1984. People forget how... Yeah. They forget how seminal that was in the, in the independent film movement at the time. It's a great movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, in, in, a, in many ways, I think that the movie that we saw uh, this week, Roma, uh, gave me the feeling of that and that it's just going to be this timeless uh, masterpiece. Uh, now, we did not do that movie, but <laughs> it's a timeless masterpiece. So, so, uh, <laughs> well, David, Sandy, thank you so much for this. Thank this you. has been a fantastic discussion. Yeah. And I think definitely will bring us into a two-parter. Uh, <laughs> but that's good. You think so? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and that's a wrap on this episode of Film Sense. If you enjoyed yourself, please be sure to subscribe, like, share, and comment. I'd like to thank our guests, David and Sandy Wasco. Our theme music was composed by Jonathan Wilkins. Our guest sound engineer was Brian Kelly Jones. Audio package courtesy of Brian Kelly Jones. Microphones courtesy of Scott Weitz. Film Sense is registered under Creative Commons. Produced by me, Frank H. Woodward. <laughs>